we're grateful for partnering with the Earth Commons, um, uh, especially working with uh, Pete Mara and Justine Bo, uh, who were very responsive to participating and collaborating on this and kicking in some money to help support this. So uh, it's, it's great. Uh, Pete has a background. He's an amateur mandolin player, and also he studies uh, bird calls, too. So bringing those two things together, I said, that's exactly what we're starting to publish on, is playing mandolin to birds. Um, but really thinking about, with, with, in ethnomusicology, we've been expanding beyond music, and a lot of people, like Mike Silvers here, have been not only thinking about sound, as something that we ought to consider beyond just music, that sometimes we're privileging music when sound matters as well. Um, but then also, um, also thinking about decentering humans from this. And maybe we ought to think from another perspective rather than just the, the human perspective, the musical perspective. So um, the partnership's great. And I want to introduce people just briefly, as briefly as I can, and then we'll let Megan take it from here. But we have a great combination of people. Megan Chapel is the Vice President of Sustainability here at Georgetown. We've made a commitment towards addressing these issues here. So we're grateful to have her leading the, the, um, the discussion. And, um, and so with Treefort, and festivals and ethnomusicology and academia, we have no idea what's going to happen, but uh, that's, been the, that's been the way we've been operating. So, Megan, I'll let you take it. Thank you for doing this, and uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Ben. Good evening, almost evening, everyone. It's nice to see you. I'm pleased to be here, and thank you for staying warm and alert in this chilly room. It's a good way to keep people awake, I guess. Um, we're also, you know, reducing our emissions by using our body heat to stay warm. And if I, that means I give permission to anyone who wants to stand up and do jumping jacks just to get your blood flowing or a little dance or something if you need to. So my name is Megan Chapel. I've been here at Georgetown for just a year and we have relaunched the sustainability efforts at the university and um, we are looking forward to more and more conversations like this and building on a legacy of these conversations over the last few decades. I'm here on behalf of the Office of Sustainability and also as an affiliate of the Earth Commons Institute, which as was mentioned by Ben, is a interdisciplinary institute that brings together all sorts of science and arts and uh, policy to help researchers collaborate, help students learn from a different perspective that's interdisciplinary, and to put thought into action. So the Office of Sustainability, which I lead, is really about the institutional practices of sustainability. And um, Pete and I have been very close collaborators since I've been here over the last year. But what I'd love to do is just um, give you a quick overview, and then I'll turn to each panelist to introduce themselves and answer the first question. So today we're going to talk about this concept of ecosystems and climate change and the planet, all with this concept of sustainability. And by sustainability, what I'm talking about there is creating a right relationship between ourselves and the planet that we call home and a right relationship between one another as we engage with the planet. Keeping all of those things healthy and thriving is our goal in sustainability. That's a very high level concept, but we'll talk about how that plays out in practicality as well. And just to couch this conversation, I know folks are aware of the issues around climate change and sustainability, but we are facing unprecedented speed of destruction of our ecological systems and our atmosphere. And this is primarily due to consumption and by means of combustion of fossil fuels. So we all in this room are responsible for that and many others as well. And it's important for us to think about the socioeconomic aspect of this. We um, know that the top 1% in terms of economic uh, strata, the top 1% contrib contribute twice as many emissions as the lower 50% economically in the world. So that tells me that the wealthy, the elite, 
the privileged are the ones causing the problem. And from experience and from observation and from research, we know that those who are bearing the burden of that problem are coming from lower economic means or from minoritized communities. And so it is an important responsibility for us to think about, again, how we relate to the planet and how we relate to one another. So my approach to this work has been as a change agent. I've worked in community development on the South Side of Chicago for a long time. I worked um, in the nonprofit sector here in DC as a, in a think tank. I've worked in the corporate sector and now in higher education. And my role has always been as a change agent. And I think about what is the broader system that I'm a part of and what are the levers for change within that system? And so I invite all of you today to consider yourselves change agents for this important issue. And how can you use the system that you're within to make change? And how do you look at that system for points of leverage and for points of influence and for points of collaboration and thinking differently? And that's what we're here to talk about today. So let me turn it over to our esteemed panelists. Um, I'm gonna start with a question that's really, what motivates you to take into consideration the state of the planet and how we relate to one another personally. And then we can talk about how that plays out in your work. But if you wouldn't mind each starting with, and Mike, we'll start with you, um, with your background and an introduction, and then we can flow into that answer to that question. Sure. My name is Mike Silvers. Oh, Mike Silvers. I am an associate professor of musicology at the University of Illinois. Um, I was Ben's, uh, we went to grad school together, uh, UCLA. Uh, and my work deals with music and the environment in Brazil. I've been doing this research for, in some sense, about 20 years now, um, thinking about relationships between music and the environment. Um, and sort of to answer the question about uh, sort of where, where my own uh, commitment to, to that issue lies, um, it's a few things. So I got into this topic, actually, because when I was starting my dissertation research, um, I knew I wanted to study a kind of, of music in Northeastern Brazil called Fajó. Um, and the literature on this kind of music is almost all about sort of rurality and sort of the creation of a rural fantasy through this music and nostalgia. And I wasn't, I wasn't super interested in that question. So then I, I mean, I'm interested in it, but, but I felt like there was something else there. Um, and I was, I was listening to the lyrics and thinking, you know, the, the fact of the matter is over half of these songs mention rain or drought in the lyrics. I wonder if there's a connection between this kind of music making um, and the climate of the place that extends beyond the song lyrics. Um, are there other kinds of ways that drought uh, has, has affected music culture um, in some broader way? So that's how I came to sort of my research question. Um, I would also say that I'm really interested in animal rights. Uh, I live with seven rabbits and a parrot. Um, they're sort of my whole world. Um, I'm a vegetarian, so I, sort of my environmentalism has a lot to do with animals. Um, yeah. So, uh, so those that you don't know me, I'm, my name is Eric Gilbert. I uh, live in Boise, Idaho, which is, um, I, I like to remind people, it's the most uh, isolated area in the lower 48 states, isolated metropolitan area in the lower 48 states. And might jump ahead slightly and just like growing up in the natural world, I think is a big reason why I care. You know, I, I live in the, I like went to the mountains a lot. And, um, you know, so I guess growing up with clean rivers and um, I don't take that stuff for for granted. The largest wilderness area in the lower 48 states is in the state of Idaho too. So um, I feel uh, great, grateful to have been able to grow around in that environment while also then becoming a big music fan and wanting to be involved in the music industry. And so um, I come out of the DIY touring world and, and Believe me, driving around a van, that was mostly between 2007, 2011, uh, 12, um, we were very aware of the, of the conflict of what we, how we were going about, you know, wanting to spread our art and take part in, in a music industry that there's natural co conflict with, um, with the, where the climate uh, uh, was heading even, you know, well before that. But so, but also recognize that music's important. So how, how do we kind of like, reconcile with that. So I helped start a festival in Boise called Treefort Music Fest. It's a multi-day, multi-discipline, um, uh, and uh, multi-venue festival. So it's now just a complete its 10th year. It's this last year in March. It, it, it's over five days. It was probably over a thousand, a thousand individual events that happened through, throughout that. And that's a series of talks and uh, families 
family pro, pro, pro programming over 500 bands and and, and um, go into that in more detail but we were also the first music festival to be uh, b corp certified which i don't know how much you know about that world and like all those things that it's imperfect but b being a b a certified b corp because we're a for profit for profit it puts a lot of um emphasis emphasis on your social and environmental impact and so we measure ourselves against those those goals and it's a transparent process so we've been close to or um carbon neutral and i think we had to buy carbon credits to be carbon neutral at one point but we, we've eliminated single-use plastics to the best of our ability and we've used solar power batteries in a, in a lot of cases once again i acknowledge it's fully imperfect as i'm here amongst the professionals but it's at least trying to lead by example and it's cool how that has rippled into our community of others now and i can kind of go into the de the details about some of those programs but um did i answer the question to yeah that's a great start Thank you. And just to be clear, like a lot of how we look at this process for change is it's a process. And um, there are there are not always right answers, but there are definitely ideas that can be acted upon and learn from. Um, and we also look at this as a journey. A lot of institutions or industries or movements take a step on that journey. In light of that, I would like to ask both of you if you could reflect on how you see this industry or even this genre of art as having a potential impact on the system, both from the content that is created to the process of creating that content to the experience that people have when they're a part of it. How do you see music really having an impact on our relationship with the planet and one another? Um, sure. So I'm curious to hear more about because it sounds like you would really experiment with sound and stuff, which I do think the music and the art itself can can speak a lot to, you know, an aspirational world. Right. And so but we look at it as organizers, too, as of a festival, like we always say that our festival. So it was more of a scene building exercise to begin with. And for us, it was amplifying the community that 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 was there that was there to be celebrated, but also being aspirational about what our community could look like. And that goes through a lot of different lenses, but one of the ways to fit in this conversation is, is being community leaders, because we kind of erect a temporary city within a city. And so we have the opportunity to um, just display what we think is possible for others in the community to do. And, and we do have a great city that's got great climate goals of their own and making their, their own efforts and they're good partners in that. But, once again, it's been fun. It's been great to watch other e events now. So one of the examples is um, we have in, instituted a steel cup uh, pro, pro program um, where people have to buy a steel cup or rent one from us, as opposed to having plastic cups for when they use like um, for 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 beer or other beverages. And it's cool now. There's like, and we've even there's been talk about a community resource of steel cups, so we don't keep buying steel cups because that has its own implications but how many other events are now Im implementing that and how many other events allow people to just bring whatever cup that they can bring now where for a long time stacks of plastic cups were in the like dumpster so that's one example yeah so yeah that's great and i'm assuming folks have learned from that do you know like what you've learned from like you said one of the things that sounds like you've learned is now how do we deal with not having too many steel cups but what are some of the other things that you've learned from that process well, for one, it was a pro it was a process, and we eased the public in into it. It was a couple of years of like, but now it's required. So the first couple of years, it was an optional program. Um, but I think just calling awareness to that to that waste, and, I, and we have we have a really great sustainability director that focuses on that in our composting program and some other things. And he would have the numbers. I unfortunately didn't bring the numbers, but he 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 likes to keep track of how many steel or how many plastic cups we didn't use. And so mm -hmm. I think. We, we, we do like to get that out into the community, you know. Well, it's important to note that you eased the community into it. So change is not always comfortable for folks, um, especially when we think we're on, we're present to be doing one thing, but our other actions have impacts that we're not thinking about, those ancillary impacts or unintended consequences, as we call them. So that's a, a really useful lesson to think about. How about you, Mike? So I think my whole, all of my research sort of thus far has been about expanding the idea of a music ecosystem, sort of what gets included, who gets left out, what gets left out of our notion of ecosystems. So for example, um, 
in my book, Voices of Drought, I have a, a chapter where I'm, I write about the history of the recording industry and the importance of a kind of wax that, that forms on a Brazilian tree that was then used in the early recording industry uh, for wax cylinders and then for wax masters for records. Um, it, the wax develops on the tree as a response to drought to protect the tree. So there's like a, so the relationship between drought in this place and the tree's production of wax and then the wax's use in the, in the invention of recorded sound. Um, and so it, our ecosystem is just so much, so much more than humans, right? And like donkeys are an important, were an important part at the turn of the century in the harvesting of this wax. And I remember when I came across that fact, like that, that donkeys had this important role. Like, I think when you're like, if you're put on like a wax cylinder or something to listen to it, but, right? I don't think you're imagining like that there were donkeys involved in getting that sound to your ears. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think that your question also is sort of getting at sort of music's capacity to educate people or to bring people into the conversation. But I think the other side of that is that music is really environmentally taxing. Um, I mean, uh, 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 right, uh, uh, the lights, the uh, transportation, all of the audience members traveling to the show, um, but even local music, like the wood that you use to make the instrument and the wax in the, you know, the materials that are in, in uh, recording technology and so forth. There's a book by a guy named Kyle Devine called Decomposed. Um, that is a really neat book. And it, it sort of, he deals with, for example, like uh, shellac, right? Is like a byproduct of a bug. Like, I don't know if people realize that, but like the lac bug, like secretes this thing that then became shellac for records, right? And I think people aren't thinking that there's like bug secretion is what shellac is. Um, anyway. That's fascinating. I mean, the, notion that we all feel we're in this constructed world with microphones and cell phones and and bots that sabotage our ticket master process um but we are really connected to the planet through those things and it can be overwhelming to think about well what goes into this device and i use this to make music record music buy my tickets whatever it may be to get to the venue um, and as a working musician, I'm using it for all sorts of logistics and coordination and booking. So there's just so much that we're connected to. Where are the rare earths that come from that go into this? What are, what's the human labor, the animal labor that goes into it? It can be overwhelming. And in light of that, it's really important for us to focus on what we can do. So in your experience, what have you, or what would you recommend um, that, folks in the audience today think about as a starting point in the work that they're doing. And just one thing they can think about doing, what is one thing you would recommend? Well, since it's a music audience, um, plastic water bottles, all, all artists want water. So find other alternatives to get them water. That's a pretty small step, but there's actually a great other, another B Corp based in Idaho is called Proud Source Water. They at least use aluminum cans, which is better than plastic. It's still but better than boxed yes, as well. Better than boxed. So <laughs> there are alternatives out there. You know, well, this is a bigger part of the bigger conversation we've been having all 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 weekend though, is that those those alternatives can be more expensive. And so that I think that, you know, we also got to figure out solutions to how we pay for those improve those improvements. But I think those are good asks of our government, you know entities or private partnerships like our partnership with the water company has been a mutually beneficial one that that you know and and they're, they've grown a lot through their partnership with us and now i think they're find their way in the music industry interesting so you help develop some economic development a business there so what's one thing you would suggest folks start with well i think just thinking about being aware of the the vast number of people and animals and other kinds of living beings that are parts of our music ecosystems. Um, just how, how multifaceted, how rich, how complex music ecosystems really are. I mean, you gave us some really good examples of how we directly connect with nature through the, the equipment and the supplies that go into music. Um, I think that's a fascinating concept. Like, can we find ways to help people feel connected to the planet? Do you have any insights on that? Or, and I know you have a video. Is this with the video? Give this, us, might, this might be a good opportunity. Yeah. Well, all right. So let me tell you about my friend. Okay. So I've been, I have a friend. His name is Gifretas. He's a fiddler and a luthier. 
um, and a composer and a visual artist and an educator and an activist uh, is all of those things. Um, and uh, so he, that's kind of a long story, is that all right? Go for it. <laughs> so Di Freitas grew up in a, in a city in Northeastern Brazil called Fortaleza um, in a neighborhood called Mucuripi, which is a, like a coastal neighborhood. His father was a chef on like a, a merchant marine ship, um, traveled the world, brought home records from all over the world for him, um, but grew up very poor. Chifretes grew, grew up very poor, um, but as a child had access to neighborhood cello lessons. There was like some organization that had music lessons. Um, and so he studied the cello and he became an orchestral musician um, and had a sort of a short-lived career uh, playing in a, in a state orchestra um, and then developed tendinitis um, and had to drop out of being uh, an orchestral musician. Um, so he, he you know, sold jewelry that he made like in the market for a while and did different things. Um, and then found himself living in a city called Juazeiro do Norte, which is um, it's sort of like the capital of this rural part of Northeastern Brazil. It's, it's inland and it's about seven hours inland from all of the major capitals of the region um, and couldn't afford an instrument. Um, and so he started studying local musical practice there, um, which is seven hours away from where he grew up uh, and learned that a lot of the traditional fiddlers in this region make their own instruments and they make their own instruments out of locally available materials. He said, well, I can afford to do that. Um, and so he uh, started looking around, well, what materials could I use to make instruments out of? So he started making his instruments out of calabash. He saw in them, first of all, calabash are like an important symbol of this place. And, um, but also they're available, right? And you can, there's like a, a shop in the market in downtown where they sell calabash. So he bought himself gourd and like figured out how can I turn this into a fiddle that's playable, that sounds nice. He spent some time working at it. Uh, then he developed a youth orchestra uh, where then the kids in his youth or or orchestra also made their own fiddles themselves. He taught them how to make fiddles. Um, so he has this orchestra of kids. And then they also have like a, a flute tradition in this region where you make your own flute out of a kind of bamboo that grows there. So it was like an orchestra of, of local music, local style music on local style instruments in which part of the aesthetic is that you make your own instrument. Um, and uh, and so this has sort of been his, his sort of his career um, and his instruments are beautiful. Um, and as a result of climate change, uh, the gourds aren't growing big enough now to be able to make his fiddles out of. Um, and uh, an important detail of the story also is my parents moved to Fortaleza about 15 years ago into the very neighborhood where he grew up where it used to be a fisherman's community and now it's high rise apartments, mostly of like foreigners from Europe who've put up these tall buildings. So I'm like part of that story, um, which is uh, you know troubling and interesting to me. Um, anyway, so now, so he couldn't afford other materials for making his instruments. So he makes his instruments out of cardboard now. Wow. Um, so that's what the video is. It's a little bit about his cardboard instruments. It, this is one of his, in the video, it's like one of his earlier versions of this, they've gotten, there's sort of less wood involved now, they're just pure cardboard. He understands the, like the visual power of playing an instrument that's made out of cardboard as a kind of a symbol of environmental crisis and economic crisis. Um, and at the same time, it's the most, uh, maybe besides plastic, the most obviously available resource lying around. Exactly, and interestingly, so thinking about also like, the multifaceted nature of music ecosystems. This, the city where he lives, um, the big industry there is shoemaking. Mm -hmm. I'm sure lots of people have like shoes that have, were made in Brazil. Um, and so he uses shoe grade cardboard because that's what's available in his town and it's stiff enough to make like a nice instrument out of. So would you mind showing us the, the clip? We'll just watch part seven minutes. We'll watch, watch all of it. Also, these are not my subtitles. <laughs>
É, meu nome é Freitas, sou luthier e educador. Aqui no Horto é uma escola, funciona uma escola onde eu desenvolvo trabalho de educação musical, esportes e onde eu faço a parte de luteria popular. Essa aqui é uma rabeca feita de papelão, que como aqui é uma escola para crianças, a ideia é facilitar o processo de construção. Então isso aqui são para crianças fazerem esse instrumento, as crianças da escola. Então esse aqui é o corpo do instrumento, que é feito de papelão. Dentro dele vem a, a barra harmônica, que é feita de pau d'arco. Pau d'arco é uma madeira bastante comum aqui na região, usada para construção. Pau d'arco, ela fica por dentro dos instrumentos, é o que sustenta o instrumento. Aí o braço, o braço ele é feito de restos de madeira, isso aqui é louro. E aqui louro canela, são madeiras da região. Aqui é pau d'arco, pau d'arco ele faz as cravelhas do instrumento, é a mesma madeira. E aqui o estandarte, que fica embaixo, que é a mesma madeira, pau d'arco. Então basicamente o instrumento é feito com essas peças, as cravelhas, o braço, o corpo, o estandarte e a barra harmônica. O braço ele é parafusado aqui, né? Give me something I had to maybe a minute before the end. But... Passa de PVC, de bambu, de vários materiais. E cada instrumento tem essa sonoridade específica. Cada instrumento é único. Thank you for that, and thank you for forging that um, relationship we bring that to us here. It was definitely, um, to me, it's striking how um, limitations create the ingenuity. And for me, that's a big lesson for how we operate here in this country for different musical events and venues and instruments is what would how can we use limits to become more creative um but anything you wanted to share about the the video that uh, we've seen it 
Well, I just want to say, so that was, obviously that wasn't his shoe grade cardboard fiddle. That was, this was sort of an earlier model that uses corrugated cardboard. But um, I think one thing that I find so interesting about his work is I really don't believe in the, like, the idea of classical music as social uplift conversation. Like, I find that very problematic. Um, and so I don't want to suggest that that's the story that I'm telling about him, like that his access to cello lessons as a child somehow made opportunities for him. In a certain sense, it did, but it could have been something else. Um, really, what created opportunities for him was the local culture that valued making instruments for yourself. Um, and a culture where, for example, like the traditional fifes that people, flutes that people play, today they're made out of PVC pipe. Um, it's not seen as like problematic or incongruous um, or like, you know, untraditional in any, in any sense. It's just, that's what, you, it's cheap. You can get PVC pipe cheap. Um, they paint them so it, you can't tell necessarily that it's PVC pipe. Um, yeah, so, so in a certain sense, I think we have, we have an aesthetic in the US by and large, or at least I want, European aesthetics are an aesthetic of reproduction and an aesthetic of sameness, an aesthetic where every violin should be made out of a similar kind of wood and every violin bow should be made out of the exact same wood. And the point is for all of those instruments to sound identical so that when they're playing in the orchestra, it sounds like one instrument, right? It's a value of sameness and repetition. And, um, and he is, is participating in an Afro-diasporic culture that values um, difference. What's Ali, what the, what's the term that I'm thinking of is, come on, ask a musicologist, tell me. Ah, uh, what's the term? You have to give us a hint. No, no, not heterophony, the heterogeneous sound ideal. Uh, <laughs> Close. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but like a, an Afro-diasporic aesthetic of, of difference contrasting with um, you know, things being contrasted with each other to create different kinds of sound qualities at the same time, that that's a value that he has. Um, that, that I don't want to suggest like what he does is somehow like inherently sustainable or inherently better, but it is both of those things. <laughs> Well, there is, um, you know, there's this whole school of thought in the sustainability movement that's called biomimicry, and it's how do we look at nature as an efficient, creative, ingenious way of creating. And if you look at an ecosystem, an ecosystem is healthier when there's more diversity in it, when there, there's more resilience in an ecosystem, when there are more different kinds to withstand different stressors and shocks. So it's an interesting parallel to think about sameness and diversity um, of instruments. So do you have any thoughts or reactions, Eric, to the... Yeah, one of the things that was coming up for me, and it related to some of the other conversations today, and I think um, related to what you were just saying too, is I think, I, I think in even the last couple of days, one thing I think, and I reflect on how we approach our festival is in, in relation to that, is that we as, you know, I, we look at ourselves as music educators too, and how we're trying to educate, we call our festival festival of discovery. And I think big part of that for me, and I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that we bring people to our festival who mostly don't know who's playing and there's like 500 bands because we, we need to be building music fans again instead of fans of celebrity and I think in large part because that's when the the ecosystem gets thrown out of whack if any one thing is too strong right and so I, I, I think that's part of all of this right and so one thing I'm just and so watching that it's like I love this you know and it doesn't I don't care how popular he is or you know what whatever it's just like music in our community now I say that because I, but I also believe you know those that have been in conversation with me, I believe that musicians need to think of their business. They are a business and they have to build a fan base. So I'm not saying that that's not part of it too, but I do think, you know, and I think you guys obviously in academia, you're building fans of music. You know, that's kind of what you guys focus on. But I do think those of us in the, in the, in, in the popular music space that gets lost a lot of times, especially with the media, obviously. But so anyways, that's something that I think is something that we can all have more collective effort on just building that, that, middle class of musicians <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's really wonderful um just so you all know we do want to open it up to questions and comments from you so we'll do that in a few minutes if you want to get your your ideas together warmed up we have had do we should we bring a mic out to the audience is that okay so we have an extra mic up here we can use for that um while you're thinking about those questions especially if there are any working musicians here in the room i'd love to hear 
from you about your perspective on this or reaction to this, that'd be really valuable. Um, as folks are beginning to think about that, earlier I asked about one small thing people could do. Let's, on the flip side of that, what is your take on the, the real impact the industry can have on creating a better relationship with the planet and one another? Like, what is the big thing that we should be focused on? I think it's localness for me. I think I think a music industry that that focuses on local musicians making music for local communities with local resources, with local woods, right? I mean, I think mm -hmm. like the, the more local, the better. Yeah, that 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 resonates with, with me with me. Also, really, I'm very passionate about the cultural exchange that comes with touring, which I know that's been a, a, a thing that I think is important, especially if, Growing up in a place like Boise, Idaho, where the cultural exchange I, I value great, greatly as I have a nine-year-old daughter, like I want to live in Boise. So that's part of it, too. I think in related to what you're saying is if, if we can build out these smaller towns and stuff in, in, in more sustainable ways, too, that people, and this goes for, from an ecological standpoint as far as just the migration needs, right? And that, so I think from a cultural standpoint, I love watching these smaller towns like Boise, Fort Collins, and these other places become real cultural hubs of their own, where we've for a long time watched the migration of youth to the bigger cities, you know, and stuff. So that feels like it's related to climate. Mm -hmm. Please tell mm -hmm. me yes. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Everything is. <laughs> but the idea of local is you're curating beauty and art and complexity in the place where you are, as opposed to looking for it somewhere else. Um, and that can have benefits in terms of less travel resources, but there is the the um, benefit of that exchange as well. So all those things contribute, but it sounds like what you're both saying is it's not just the water bottles and it's not just the materials we use for the instruments, but it's creating that sense of place and that connection with one another in place that is really essential to creating more sustainable systems. So that's, that's an important takeaway for me. So thank you for that. Love to open it up. Are there thoughts, questions, reactions, observations? Great. I will. You have one? Okay. Would you mind introducing yourself too? Uh, my name is Graham Sapoy. I live here in DC. Uh, I'm an eco musician. I have an eco musical practice. Um, I take solar panels and recording equipment into the woods in the wilderness and I use it as a studio. Um, and to answer your question, uh, in that practice, uh, I've worked with environmental justice issues in Southern Virginia around pipelines and we used music to shut down $16 billion worth of gas infrastructure during the pandemic. So I know a lot about that. <laughs> and it's really interesting because music is organizing. We get people together and we give them a message. And a lot of time that message is a personal message, which can be useful and local stuff. But sometimes that message is about things that are nuanced and hard. You can't have person to person conversations with people. You have to put it into art. Um, and the question that I wanna ask is related to that. Uh, what are your thoughts on support infrastructure to go to that because so much of what we've been talking about today is about how do you personally make money at that and then what is the, the money is the goal, but for these things money is not the goal. Um, it's actually the opposite of money, we want the money to not be spent uh, and. I'll share just a little bit of prompt with that with that band that we did the work with our metric was whether or not people are crying whether we're giving them permission to feel the pain and the loss and the dissatisfaction and all of that in what they're doing and how do you support people in doing that? So your question is how to support that approach? Okay, thank you. Brilliant question and thank you for the work you do. Um, this is a theme that we're seeing in the world of sustainability that a lot of folks find getting to action, the barrier between taking action, even if it's a small step, is a resistance to feeling the emotional. And the idea of climate grief is real. Um, and a lot of the work that I am now doing with executives at the university is creating space for people to feel their feelings when they hear about how quickly things are devolving and what the long-term impacts will be. So the point you're making about creating this other form of connection and communication 
is really, really important. So I'd love to hear what you two have to say about how to create that connection and that communication on a different level. I, I agree. I think music's a great uh, vehicle for that. You know, one thing I love about music is um, it is organizing, but you, you can be alone too. You can be alone amongst other folks and in your thoughts. So it's a great opportunity to reach people in, in, in a thoughtful space. And so we take that seriously as pro programmers. Like it's really important to us to have a program of artists that are making thought thoughtful music. I mean, sure, fun music too, but we, we pay a lot of attention to that. So I, I think, um, and, and then also, like I said, we do a lot of talk-based stuff because I think, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's great. And so I do think it's be holding on those that have the ability to provide a, plat a, a platform, if you, you know, to, to do that. Or also may maybe the cities can have solar power in the park so you can go plug in, you have to move your solar power tra uh, trailer around. So that's so one idea. That's great. First of all, the idea that music is organizing is like a phrase is like ringing in my ears. I think it's really powerful. Um, and thank you for your, your good work. It's really fantastic. Um, I think how I support the, you know, these kinds of efforts is helping. I think I try to help Gifredes tell his story. Um, so we've gone to conferences together and um, he also spends a, all of his free time really on his motorcycle going around to, um, it, Brazil has a program where, uh, you can, if you are like a, a knowledge bearer, a culture bearer in your community, you can apply to the government for a kind of retirement. Um, so, you know, so you're like, there's the guy who like knows all the things about the, like medicinal plants, right? And, and, and then, so Gifreitas goes on his motorcycle to help these people fill out applications to apply um, to the government so they can get these retirements. And, um, and I try to support him in that when I'm there and, and helping these musicians do their thing. Is this about sort of the environment? Uh, no, but these people are affected by environmental change. They're, you know, they're the most vulnerable, you know, some of the most vulnerable, vulnerable people. So, yes. You have a question? I think Zoom can't hear you without it. Hi, it's Danny. Whoa. Um, I just think Tree Fort. One of the things you guys do, you might not recognize that you do it, but you're bringing all these musicians and people into venues that already exist. You know, so you're utilizing spaces that are already there instead of creating huge monstrous structures and bringing people into a space and abandoning all the other places, leaving them empty. I think that's a really important thing. And if we wanna kind of combat supporting that kind of waste, um, you know, we can, or we can start messaging more to say, hey, come out and support these places that are utilizing private spaces. Oh, God. Thanks, Danny. You sound like a venue owner. Are you... <laughs> Hi, um, Jamie Duffy from Denver, Colorado. I, maybe my inner cynic is coming out. I am so and like climate grief is real, but also so is like a lack of hope. And I'm a little concerned that we are, like, are we doing to the local music industry what has been done to all of us around like recycling? Like, this is you, this is your problem. This is your fault. You're the one who caused this, but we're not talking about big corporations, the United States military, and other nations who are like the actual problem. And like, I feel like we're locally, these folks, like what Eric's doing is amazing, but like, is our, you would know more about this than I do, but like, is our exchange of tin cup gonna move it? Because from what I'm reading, it's not. And so, A, I don't know if that's true, but everything I'm reading is like, it's a done deal unless we can collectively organize to elect the most progressive people possible and aggressive people on climate change. And so I wonder if like, yes, we keep doing our efforts, but it, are we missing the, the broader effort, which is we have to get people globally in positions of power to make real aggressive changes now or it's done. 
So am I just like super reading the wrong thing? I mean, you know, is this just a drop in the sand in comparison to what has to happen to actually save the species, all species on this planet? I'll take that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I that that resonates for sure. Like, um, yeah, and I mean, I, I am curious if that's the question too, but but I, I will say, and I totally, and I know that's not where you're coming from, but it's very conscious on our side that we're, we're not saying we're doing enough or that, or that it's even our responsibility, you know, you know, so, um, but I do think it goes back to, and I think what you're getting at too, is if, if we as a music community need to get the message out more about that and be more explicit about it, then, then, then we should be talking about that because, because I guess um, the subliminal messages aren't working apparently. Is that what you're trying to hit? So, yeah.